Uh, today's webinar is uh, made possible through our Forestry and Natural Resource webinar series. It's a partnership here in the southeast led by myself, Robert Barton, here at North Carolina State University with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Bill Hubbard, who's the Extension Forester with the Southern Regional Extension Forestry Office, and Eric Taylor, who is with Texas AgriLife Extension. Let's begin with this poll to give our speaker an idea of where we're participating from today. So if you could please chime into the poll. Give everybody here a second. Okay, let me publish those uh, results up to the board for everybody to see. We have a good mix of folks. We have folks as far west as the mountain region. And uh, we have people here pretty much throughout the east and central parts of the United States. Thank you for joining today. One more poll, and then we'll be starting the presentation. Let's give the, let me clear the current poll, and now please chime in on this poll to give the speaker an idea of the audience they're dealing with. Remember, to participate in the poll, you click on the fourth icon below your name. It has a little letter A on it, and that will give you a chance to respond to this poll. Okay, it looks like most people have chimed in. Let me publish those results up so we can move on to the important part of today's webinar. And as you can see, uh, we have a good mix of the audience with uh, leaning a little bit towards the government side, but that's good. They have a lot to do with land management. And with that, let me introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Carol Denoff, and she's with the Longleaf Alliance. Carol, I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, great, Bob. Thank you so much. Um, I need to go back a couple of slides, it looks like. Um, well, thanks, everybody, for showing up today and um, logging in for this talk on Longleaf Understory. What basically we're going to do today is we're going to kind of get a broad um, stroke overview of um, what it takes to restore understory in the longleaf system. And what we're going to talk about, um, we're talking about basically breaking it down into four different sections. One, we're going to talk about the benefits of understory. So why should you restore understory? Secondly, we're going to look at some of the common species that you would, um, that you would find in the understory, as well as those common species that are being used in reintroduction, so with seed mixes and such. Um, then we're going to talk about some of the um, restoration process elements. And um, finally, we're going to um, finish up with looking at a few different restoration scenarios, so looking at what your starting land is and what you, where you want to go and how you need to get there. So first, let's um, let's jump right in and start talking about why people want to restore understory. For many years now, people have been putting trees back in the ground, but just recently in the last few years, people have really started um, giving the attention to restoring the understory as well so they can get that whole ecosystem approach with their restoration projects. First off, one of the main reasons that people are so interested in understory is that is the plant diversity that you find in these in the system. Um, when people talk about the uniqueness of of the longleaf system and why how it's so diverse, they're not talking about the overstory and the tree species. They're talking mainly about those understory species. And we have so many species because uh, these sites are frequently burned, and um, that. Um, regular disturbance regime really encourages a high diversity of herbaceous plant species and low-growing shrub species as well. 
the diversity in these systems is um, incredible at smaller spatial scales. Usually, you can um, compare the, um, the diversity, the species richness at these smaller spatial scales to systems like the rainforest in many situations. Um, you can have up to 150 species in a quarter acre um, piece of land. So that's um, an incredible um, diversity of species. You also see differences in the species richness across um, soil moisture gradients within the longleaf system because you can have um, longleaf growing in um, very dry, sandy, um, turkey oak sand hill habitats all the way into more mesic sites where you might have um, pitcher plant bogs interspersed. So with that increase in soil moisture, you're going to have more species richness. And it also, com um, the composition of many of these systems varies across the region. So longleaf occurring from Virginia all the way to Texas, you're going to have quite a bit of variation in what the species composition is in those, in those sites. With the plant diversity, you also have higher wildlife diversity. With all of those plants, there are different animals um, that depend on those plants for different parts of their, their life. Um, the understory species provide both cover and food for many wildlife species. And um, game birds thrive in herbaceous habitats. Um, and another, um, another subject that's becoming more and more important for people is encouraging um, or restoring to um, enhance pollinator habitat. Are you guys able to see the slides? See, we were having an issue with the slide. Okay. Another Carol, reason. Carol, we're yes. still on a slide that says longleaf understory benefits. OK, I guess I'm advancing on my screen, but it's not advancing on everyone else's. I'm not sure what the problem uh, is. Are you sure you're advancing the slides inside Illuminate? I mean, inside Collaborate. Yes. I'm clicking on go to the next page. Uh, <laughs> you are somewhere else. OK. So up in the top uh, right corner, is there, there's mm -hmm. a little word that says follow. Is that checked on your screen? Yes. And what slide number are you on? I am on slide 12 of 66. Fine fuels? It's fine fuels, yes. OK, you could just tell me to advance. I don't know why your slides aren't advancing. OK. One of the, another main reason why people are wanting to restore understory is to restore that functionality to the system. Um, in some situations where um, people are restoring their sites back to longleaf, they may be starting with an ag field where you're not going to have the fine fuels that are necessary for, for feeding um, the fire that's needed to manage the system. So these understory species provide those fine fuels. And grasses are especially beneficial. Perennials, and many of these species are perennial that are adapted to fire. They thrive in it. They come back very quickly following a fire. So um, it's really necessary to have these species in there if you want to um, encourage fire in your system. Next slide, please. Can you hear me, Bob? Next slide. Yes. OK, ours are advancing. Yours are not? No. <laughs> OK, sorry. Um, next to the word follow, there's two arrows that point left and right. Yes. And do you have a red box around your slides? Yes. Unclick that, those okay. two arrows. OK. Now, now they advance on your screen. Yes. OK. okay. Great. Technical difficulties. Sorry, everyone. Um, so th that fire is very important. It's very, um, the interaction between these fine fuels of the understory species is really important to have um, for encouraging fire in your system for management purposes. So now that we've talked about some of the benefits of understory um, in the longleaf system, let's go on to um, some of the 
common species that you would find in um, the longleaf system. Let's do a quick poll now to see um, how many of the um, participants today have attended one of our understory workshops. Yeah, just give a show of hands. OK, so I see a few of you have, have um, attended one of our workshops. We're going to talk about many of the species that we learned about in those workshops, so you'll probably be familiar, but this will be a good refresher for you. Um, in our understory workshops, we um, talk a lot about um, species identification of understory species, as well as talking about restoration techniques as well. So I encourage you, if you're interested in the subject, to try to get in on one of our workshops. But when you're talking about the species that occur in, in the longleaf system, um, there are so many different plant families represented, but the three largest plant families that you find growing out in the system are grasses, legumes, and composites. And so what I've done today is just um, brought in several common species from each one of those families um, that, are, um, that you would find growing naturally, but as well that are being used in seed mixes. First, let's talk about the native warm season grasses. And when you're talking about the grass component in the longleaf understory, you're basically talking about two somewhat distinct regions um, within the longleaf range. And in this map, you'll see the lighter shading is, are areas that are dominated by wire grass. Um, blue stems may or may not be present in those systems, but what your, but your primary grass that you're targeting is going to be wire grass. And then the areas with the darker shading um, are areas where blue stems are more dominant, so your andropogons and your schizocariums. In those regions, you, you don't have any wire grass that occur, so that's outside the wire grass range. First, let's talk about wire grass, it being kind of um, the end all be all of grasses, if you will. People want to have uh, wire grass established back on their longleaf lands because it is such a great grass. It's a large, densely tufted bunch grass that um, um, is, is very pyrogenic. It's, it traps longleaf pine um, needles within the grass blades, which add to its um, pyric nature. So it's a great great plant to have on your landscape. Um, you can identify it by the, um, when it's in bloom by the, um, by the seeds, seed heads. You'll have each seed has three awns. And um, sometimes this is called um, pineland three on because of the seed. It occurs in pine savannas and flatwoods, and it's a great um, plant for nesting for quail, provides cover and forage for gopher tortoises, and the seeds are occasionally consumed by songbirds. So, um, so it's a great wildlife plant as well. And what I'm going to do with these species, I'll just talk about kind of what they look like, where they occur, and then what their wildlife usage is. Muley grass is another um, very common grass that's used in seed mixes. It occurs across a wide range of habitats, so it can can grow in just about any kind of um, moisture gradient. Um, it can look like wire grass when it's not blooming. Um, it, the, the leaf blades can be wiry at times, but when it's in bloom, it has these very um, airy pink panicles of um, in, panicle in, inflorescence, um, very showy in the fall. This is used a lot in the landscape business as well provides cover for wildlife, and the seeds are, are eaten by birds. Piney woods drop seed is another plant that, um, that is a look-alike of wiregrass. Um, when it's not blooming, you might, um, you might confuse it with wiregrass. The one way to tell wiregrass from some of these look-alikes is at the base of the wiregrass blade, you're going to have a tuft of hair, which you don't have in these other species. Um, this can be a wiry grass. Its leaves are a little bit different in color from the wire grass, and then the inflorescence is a pyramid-shaped panicle. So it's a bit different um, 
it's distinctly different from wiregrass when it's blooming. This is one of those plants that might be a good um, kind of surrogate for, for wiregrass if, you, if you're living in an area, if your land is in an area where wiregrass is not, not um, present. You might want to use this species because it does, um, is, is going to do a lot of the same, fill the same kind of niche that wiregrass since it's wiry bunch grass that um, is going to be a good fine fuel species. The next grass is the big blue stem. This is Andropogon gerardii. And this is one you're going to see in patches around throughout the longleaf system. It's uh, really common in the Midwest and prairie systems, um, but it does occur in the longleaf system. And it's usually more in your mesic sites with a little bit more soil moisture is where it's going to do better. Um, it's a very large grass, can grow up to eight feet tall. And it's different from your broom sedge in that the inflorescence is um, not fluffy and white colored like the broom sedge is. This is more brown in color and looks like a turkey foot when mature. Um, this is, because it is such a big grass, it's a great cover species. Um, so great for cover and nesting sites. And the seeds are uh, readily eaten by the game birds and songbirds. And um, the foliage is good for forage as well. This is another common um, blue stem that you'll find. And this is usually found growing in your drier, sandy sites. Um, you'll, this is a good one for those sites where you have a little bit deeper sands. Um, it has a long inflorescence stalk that up to two inches in length. And that's how you can tell the difference between um, that's how you can tell the difference between this grass and broom sedge, is that this one is stalked and the flowering parts are held away from the main stem, whereas the broom sedge is going to be kept closer into the stem. This is where this is broom sedge. You can see the inflorescence here. It is kept clo more closely to the stem as opposed to the split beard um, blue stem. This species, broom sedge, is your common kind of old field species, grows in a variety of habitats. It's one of those plants that's going to come in on its own more than likely. So you might not need to, to plant this one out. So in many of your old field situations, it's probably just going to come in on its own. So it might not need to be seeded. Little blue stem, this is um, the dominant species that you're going to find in those areas where wiregrass is not occurring, so outside the wiregrass range. It's a very common bunch grass. It grows up to four feet tall. Um, the difference between the Schizocarium and the Andropogon is that the Schizocariums have a single raceme, like you see here, whereas the Andropogons have the double raceme. Um, that's the, the main way to tell the difference between those. And unfortunately, you have to wait until the fall when they're blooming to do that. So throughout the growing season, it's kind of tough to tell the difference between these. You kind of get a feel, whereas this plant is a little bit more slender and like the name implies, little blue stem, it's a little bit more slender and more delicate than your broom sedge. Toothache grass, this is a great one for those more mesic, wetter sites. You usually find it growing in um, wet to moist pine flatwoods, savannas, prairies, and pitcher plant bogs. Um, so this is, if you've got a wetter site, this would be a good grass to include in your seed mixes. It's a little bit unpredictable as far as um, wild seed and getting good seed off of plants. So it's got to be a good year in order to get some good seed produced off of it. Um, it is a bunch grass. It forms dense clumps. And this, the dis distinctive part of this grass is this um, inflorescence. It looks a lot like a comb. And as it matures, it will actually curl up kind of into a curly cue um, as the seeds mature. Switchgrass, this is um, used also in seed mixes. And as many of you know, it's probably um, it's being used in the biofuels industry. It burns really hot. Um, so if you want to use it in your seed mixes, I would um, suggest using it in smaller, um, smaller parts for the seed mix just because I wouldn't want to have it grows uh, fairly quickly and will kind of um, 
grow across the site pretty quickly, so you don't want to be um, have an infested infestation of switchgrass. But it grows in a variety of habitat types, but it's going to prefer those wet mesic to mesic soil conditions. Yellow Indian grass, there are a couple of different Indian grasses that are being used in seed mixes. This is um, probably the most common one. This is yellow Indian grass or Sorgastrum nutans. Um, it has um, it's a it's a rhizomatous grass species, so it um, is more of a runner instead of a bunch grass. A lot of times you'll see it growing on roadsides, but it grows well in plantations, open forests, forest margins, and right of way. So it um, it's a pretty tough plant and um, will establish pretty easily. The other more common Indian grass that's being used also is called lopsided Indian grass. And this is great for sites that are a little bit drier, so um, more well-drained soils. Um, it has a very distinctive um, inflorescence. It's called lopsided Indian grass because the, the flowering parts hang to one side of, of the grass, or of that um, flowering stem. And so it's lopsided, and that's why it, where it gets its name. Another way to tell um, Indian grasses from other grasses when you don't have the flowering parts is to look for this structure on the leaf blade um, called the ligule. It is a membrane that sticks up right at this juncture of where the blade comes away from the stem. And it's a very distinctive characteristic of these Indian grasses. So that's just some of the common grasses. Let's go into some of the composites. And when I say composites, I, I mean plants that are in the sunflower or asteraceae family. And they get their, that name because the flowers are arranged in a composite head that's subtended by bracts. Um, so um, that's why they're called composites. It's one of the largest flowering plant families with around 1,100 genera and 19,000 species. It occurs across the globe in a variety of different climates. And in the long leaf system, you're going to find it from the xeric sites to the wet mesic sites. So it's a very common species. This is one that's going to really put shows on in the fall. You see all the yellows and purples in the long leaf system. Those are going to be mostly your composite species. Great pollinator plants. One of the common ones that you're going to see is this purple flowering plant. It's called tall ironweed or Vernonia angustifolia. It has vibrant purple um, discoid uh, flowers or an inflorescence. And it has uh, very narrow, um, deeply incised mid-vein um, leaves on it, um, alternately arranged on the stem. It inhabits dry soils in longleaf pinelands and pine savannas. So it's a pretty um, hardy species in terms of where, um, where it grows. Brown-eyed Susan, um, this is a really common species. It's one of these very, it's a short-lived perennial. So when you seed it out, it basically keeps reseeding itself. Um, it's how it um, persists on your site. It has large, bright yellow flower heads. It's very common. Most people, when they think of composites, they think of this look of um, a flower. It's found in um, plantations, open forests, forest openings, and right-of-ways. Um, so it occurs in pretty tough situations. Um, so it'll thrive in just about anywhere. Anna's scented goldenrod. Um, this is Solidago odora. It's a, um, it blooms in late summer to early fall. It has bright yellow flowers. And the main um, identifying characteristic that I always use in identifying this plant is the leaves and the, really the whole plant smell like licorice or anise when you crush it. Um, so that's a very quick um, identification trick when you're out in the field to figure out if it's this species or not. It's common in open forests, along forest margins, um, and right-of-ways. So you see it pretty much throughout. Rayla sunflower, this is one that's going to grow in more of your uh, music to wet music sites and along along with um, toothache grass. So if you've got a wetter site, this would be a good one to use in a seed mix. So pine flatwoods, savannas, and pine barrens. Um, has very rough basil leaves that run along the ground, like you see here in this lower picture. 
And that's what you're going to see most of the year, is just those basil leaves. But in the fall, they, they shoot up these really interesting um, maroon brown, dark maroon brown flower heads, um, which don't have any um, significant ray flowers on them, just disc flowers. Spiked blazing star, this is Lyetris spicata. It's another one that occurs and um, does really well in wetter sites, although there are a multitude of species of Lyetris that occur from the very dry xeric sites all the way to the wet. So, um, and many of them are becoming more and more available on the market for seed mixes. It has a really bright purple flower on a slender, um, slender stem that can reach up to five feet in height. And when you have a, a field of it, it's really quite spectacular. Um, but it's found in forest openings, bogs, and meadows growing on those mesic to wet soils. Now let's go into some of the legumes. So why, why include legumes. There's a lot of talk about legumes, especially when you're restoring for wildlife. Um, it's a, they're an important contributor to the overall diversity of the system. There's so many different um, legume species that you find in the understory. Um, the foliage is a preferred forage for, for deer, gopher tortoises, rabbits, and pocket gophers. Um, seeds are a component of the diets of bobwhite quail, wild turkeys, small mammals, and seed-eating songbirds. So uh, wildlife of all sorts utilize legumes. And another really important feature of legumes is that they can convert atmospheric nitrogen into forms that are usable by plants. And this is really important in a system like the longleaf system where you have such frequent fires where you're depleting that nitrogen that's available to plants. So you need to have more um, input into the system. This is a species that we're, um, that is, is coming on the market more and more. Um, it was actually grown last year by the Georgia Forestry Commission, bare root, um, available for, for landowners or anyone to purchase. Um, but it's an erect plant that's covered with these um, soft silver, silvery hairs. The, leaves, the leaflets are oval shaped and you have a white to pale yellow flower um, with this plant. And this is, this is one we're encouraging people to use um, instead of some of your Asian lespidises, like your bicolors and, and such, um, trying to encourage people to use the native lespidises instead of the Asian lespidises when they're planting for wildlife. But this grows in a variety of different habitats, forest openings, old fields, and right-of-ways. And the seeds are great for wildlife as well as the foliage. Goat shrew, this is a common one that you're going to find across the range, really. Um, Tephrosia virginiana. There are a few different species of Tephrosia, but this one's going to be probably the most common one you'll see um, with the widest distribution. It has a pinnately compound leaf, and it has this really unique bicolored flower. Um, and the, the way that the plant grows, it grows. Are you guys having trouble hearing me? No, everything's OK. OK. Um, it, um, the way it grows, it grows as more of a shrub. It has a shrub habit, although it is an herbaceous um, perennial plant. And because it is a kind of a, a sh has a shrub habit, um, it's a great cover um, plant for wildlife. This, it produces lots and lots of seed that are eaten by quail and other songbirds, and the foliage is eaten by deer and gopher tortoises. Spurred butterfly pea, this is one that um, is being sold by Roundstone Native Seed, it's, um, and Lolly Creek is growing it as well. It's um, called Centrosema virginianum. It's a, a vining plant, and it has these large, um, one, up to one inch um, purple flowers with spreading petals. And you'll see it growing throughout, found in um, more mesic open woods. And it produces a, a lot of seed that are used by um, many of our wildlife species. Partridge pea, this is one that, you know, that common plant species that has been used in seed mixes for the last few years in many of the cost share programs. And we had some issues with one of the cultivars of this plant, um, it's called Lark, that was, um, that was um, 
cultivated to grow in food plots, and um, it was selected because it was a very large, um, tall growing plant. Our native Chemicrista fasciculata grows up to only about three feet tall, and it has these really bright, large yellow flowers, and it produces a, a large number of seed for, for wildlife. It's uh, another one of those plants that's, um, that a lot of times will come in in old field situations. It's one of the first ones to start coming in. Um, you can find it growing in plantations, roadsides, old fields, and open forests. So it's going to do well in those more rural situations. Sensitive briar, this is one you've probably stepped on a million times. It's a um, kind of a sprawling, viney type plant. It has um, these really bright pink pom-pom type flowers growing on it that are tipped in yellow. Um, it has thorns that cover the plant, and the leaves will actually close up if touched, and that's why it's called sensitive briar. It um, grows in more um, dry, sandy soils, um, typically, and the seeds are eaten by quail, other songbirds, and gopher tortoises. This is a great gopher tortoise plant. They utilize just about every part of the plant since it's growing right there in, in their zone. Florida tick tree foil, this is one of our native desmodiums, Desmodium floridanum. And Lolly Creek is growing this one. And uh, Roundstone is using it in their seed mixes. It's a perennial herb that can reach up to three feet in height. and has a really rough feel to the leaves and stem. And the fruit are sticky. So when you come out of the woods in the fall and you've got, um, usually you'll, you'll be covered in Desmodium seed because that's really their primary um, way of dispersing is sticking onto critters or people walking through the woods. Um, the seeds are great for, for wildlife. And it's also a pollinator host plant. And the, um, the foliage is great forage for deer. So, so that's just a brief overview of some of the common species. And like I said, many of the, all of those plants are being used in seed mixes. And so they're just some good options for you in, in terms of um, what plants to use. Because that's really one of the biggest questions we get is what plants should I use in my seed mix on my site? And it really depends on what your site is like. So that's why I included that um, information about the habitat for each plant. So you can kind of see what you should use on your sites. So now let's go into the actual process of restoration um, for understory. And um, let's do another poll here. Um, I'd like to see, by show of hands, how many of you have been involved in some um, type of understory restoration project? Great. Well, it looks like we have a good experienced group with us today. So let's, um, let's go forward and um, look at um, some of the elements for restoring understory. And before I, before I get started on this, just to, um, as a caveat, um, everybody has done this a different way. So if you talk to uh, one practitioner or a landowner, and everyone has done it a little bit differently. So trying to come up with just a, um, a scripted plot, if you will, of how to do it is somewhat difficult. So it really depends on what your site is. But when you're, when you're doing a restoration project, the most important, one of the more important things to do is develop a good restoration plan. So before you get started, figure out what you want to do. And the first part of that is identifying what your degradation factors are. So why, um, what has degraded your site, um, and what do you need to fix to, to move forward? Secondly, you need to define your goals and objectives. Everybody, every landowner is going to have a little bit different, differing opinion on what your goals and objectives should be. So you need to figure out what you want to do. Um, thirdly, identify your reference community. So look at other sites that you think are what you want to get to with your site. So looking at that, um, figure out um, that's going to be your end product. So figure out what your reference community should be. Um, determine necessary restoration activities. So if you know what your reference community is, figure out what you need to do to get there. 
And then finally, develop a realistic restoration schedule because you know along the line you're probably going to have to change that, um, that schedule a bit. So just try to develop a, a schedule for implementing every step of that process. So determine site needs and landowner objectives. This is one of the most important things when trying to figure out how you want to restore your site. Um, every site may not need extensive site prep and planting if understory already occurs. That's a really important point to make because if you've got a wooded site that um, has not seen fire for decades, um, you might already have understory still growing underneath all of that midstory. Um, so what you need to do is um, figure out how you need to proceed with that. So don't automatically do a lot of um, chemical spraying that's going to affect your understory composition. However, you might need to do more intensive site prep if invasives or other comp competitors are an issue. So you just need to figure out what your, what your site needs um, are going to be. And then secondly, you need to figure out what your objectives are. Um, if you have to do planting um, for, for establishment of understory, then you need to figure out what plant species you plant, and that really depends on your objectives. Um, you could be planting for plant diversity, you could be planting for wildlife or pollinators, or you could just be planting for um, a cost share program where you're trying to restore that functionality, where you're just trying to get some fine fuels on the ground to um, be able to burn that site again. Um, so I'd like to take a quick poll here as well to um, get a show of hands on why you're interested in restoring understory on your site. Because um, everybody does have um, differing opinions on why they need to be doing this. First, I'd like to see how many of you are interested in restoring understory for wildlife. Just a show of hands. Great. Secondly, how many of you are uh, restoring just to get function back into the system so you can, so you can burn? OK. And then thirdly, how many are planting for plant diversity? That goes, really goes hand in hand with the wildlife, but it's interesting to see if someone just wants to restore for the aesthetic of the plant diversity. OK, let's move on. This is just a, a slide showing a, um, the relationship between time and resources needed for restoration and the abundance of uh, remnant biota on the site to be restored. And it really just shows you uh, what your um, original site is like, how long it's going to take, basically that relationship um, between how long it's going to take to restore and what, you, what you're starting with. So implementing the restoration project. Um, preparing the site for restoration, managing competition, increasing biodiversity, and monitoring. So first off, you need to prepare the site, and the key factors you need to address are obviously soils, hydrology, and light. Um, soils can be impacted by if it was an old ag field or if it was a, um, a plantation area that had been bedded. You have to address issues with the soils. Um, hydrology would need to be addressed if the hydrology had been affected by canals or, um, or bedding as well. And then light um, is pretty um, self-explanatory in that you need to get light back on the ground to restore understory species. Managing competition, this is a really um, important piece of the puzzle. Um, if you don't um, control that competition before you start your restoration project, you're going to have a whole lot of problems, especially when it comes to having um, invasive species like Kogon grass. If you don't get that out of there before you, um, you start planting your, your native warm season grasses and such, you're going to have a big problem. So you have to get that in check before you can move forward 
Woody competition as well, you got to um, control it um, with fire, mechanical, and or chemical treatments um, for to, to move forward as well. After, you're, after you've got that competition in check, um, you, you can start increasing your biodiversity. And in some situations, just reintroduction of fire can increase the understory plant diversity. So those are sites that already had those species growing there, but were just dormant um, because of lack of light. Um, but when no understory exists, you're going to have to supplement with plant material. So um, plant material sources, you can get material from a number of different um, sources. Um, you could buy from commercial producers. You can buy from several state nurseries that are set up. Um, and um, you can also collect from donor sites. So those are, that's wild, more wild collected seed, where you're collecting from a site and then using that bulk seed back onto a, a site, an adjacent site that is being restored. Um, you can um, plant by either planting plugs or live material or planting seed material. And an important note here is that when you're planting either live material or seed material, it's important to look for ecotype seed or plants that are locally sourced. And more and more of those are coming on the market and are becoming more available. This is just a table. We're not going to go through this whole table, but it's just something for you guys to have. Um, this came from Walker and Saletti in the um, Longleaf Pine Ecosystem book. Um, just some comparisons of direct seeding and outplanting options, so advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, it really depends on you, um, whoever's doing that restoration, which one of those you want to choose. Sorry. So planting live material, um, your target density for most species is around three plants per meter square when you're planting live material. And that can add up pretty quickly when you're talking about you know, hundreds of acres. Um, but with live material, you can plant those by hand or with a mechanical tree planter. Um, it just depends on your site um, and, and kind of accessibility of it. Lots of people choose plant, or to plant seed material because it is a little bit more economical than planting plugs. Um, when, when you're planting seed, it's important to get a good seed to soil contact. And you don't want to plant these native um, warm season grasses and native, native species more than a quarter of an, an inch deep. Um, the seeding methods that are used, um, you can use a seed drill, um, such as a grasslander or a truax drill. And, um, or you could do broadcast seeding. Um, and you, there are some broadcast uh, seeders that are used. Some people have used hay blowers. Um, I've heard talk of people using um, hydro seeders. So um, you can use a variety of different methods for seeding. Here's some of the seeding and planting rates um, that are used. It's widely variable among restoration practitioners. So everybody you ask is going to tell you a, a little bit different number, but these are fairly average numbers. Um, with seed sowing rates and a seed drill, you're going to look at about 15 to 60 pure live seed seeds per square foot. And with broadcasting, um, you're looking at about 10 to 20 pounds of bulk seed per acre. And when you're Planting plugs it varies by the species that you're planting. Um, but for wiregrass, for example, you can plant two to 4,000 plugs per acre to get a really good stand of wiregrass. And then monitoring the site is important, obviously. You, can, um, you need to monitor your restoration to see, kind of, to measure your success and um, see what works for you. So let's briefly go over some of the restoration scenarios. So first off, let's, um, let's say we have an old field site. Um, the current conditions of the site, um, you have little to no existing desired understory and no canopy. Um, and what you want to get to is you want to establish understory in order to reintroduce fire for site management. So you're basically just you wanting to reintroduce a basic mix of, of um, understory species. And then you also want to establish longleaf canopy as well. But we're just going to talk about the understory portion of that. So for site prep for understory establishment, you're going to use multiple chemical treatments to, um, to eliminate the invasive species that are in that field. 
and then you're going to disc and cultipack the site prior to seeding. The understory treatment that we would use, um, we would sow a basic seed mix using a grain drill. Since you have a wide open site, using a drill is perfect for this type of situation. Uh, and as far as management, once you get those, the, those plants established, um, you're going to use fire to manage it and um, use spot chemical treatments if any of those invasives try to come back. So this is what it would look like in the beginning and then this is what it would look like after seeding. This is a field at the Jones Center where they have um, seeded in wiregrass. And this is just a sample um, seed mix that you might use um, with rates um, per acre. And this is what is um, on the job sheet for the um, CRP, the CP36 um, cost share in um, Georgia. Now if you have a plantation site um, where the current conditions, you've got an 18-year-old longleaf plantation that's recently thinned. And it has widely scattered native understory presence. So you've got some growing in there and you don't have any invasives. Your goal is you want to manage site for timber and wildlife and you want to enhance existing understory and supplement with desirable species. So for your site prep, you're going to use a prescribed burn prior to planting that seed. Um, an understory treatment, you're going to sow understory species with a seed drill between trees. And for your management of the site, you're going to use fire. And this is a sample seed mix that you would use. You see that it's a lot more diverse than the other seed mix that we were using for just the old field. Um, so you have a, a, a larger number of grass species as well as forb species. So you're going to be you're targeting um, an understory that's going to be great for wildlife. Then if you have a forested site, your current conditions, you've got a mature longleaf forest with altered fire regime, so it hasn't been burned in quite a few years. Um, it's got a thick midstory of hardwoods, and the understory is impacted by that shade. So your goals are to restore regular, a regular fire regime, enhance wildlife populations, and enhance plant diversity. Um, so for site prep, what you would do is burn if possible. Alternatively, use mechanical and or chemical treatments to remove midstory and then follow with regular fire. Um, understory treatment, so supplemental planting might not be necessary in this situation if that understory rebounds. However, if it doesn't, you might want to augment the site with rare species or wiregrass if desired and use prescribed fire at two to five year intervals. So regular burns will continue to enhance that diversity and then you could um, plant some wiregrass seed in, um, in open forest patches if you want to. So just to, to finish up, I, I've listed out some resources for you, some seed sources, some technical advice, um, places that you can contact for te technical advice. And then on this page, we have um, some manuals and other publications. And I, I believe we've got some of those PDFs available for you guys. We've got um, these first two listed. And um, I also included a manual that the folks at Roundstone Native Seed have put out about restoring understory as well. So that finishes up my, um, my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions if we have any, or I think we have some quiz questions as well, Bob. Do you want to do that now? Uh, let's open it up to questions for uh, the audience. Uh, the quiz is uh, automated, and they'll participate that at the end of the session. So I okay, see great. Chris Pate has raised his hand. Chris, if you got a question, if you'd like to type that in the chat window, we can get to it. Okay, Kendall. You have a question? Typing them in the chat window. That's good. Okay, we've got a question here. What is a good burn rate after planting? Um, is this for after seeding? I guess it, um, I would I would wait a year or two um, 
after seeding, uh, before or actually after you see some plants coming up, you don't want to really want to burn those those new seedlings um, because they won't be able to to do well with that. So I would wait a, a, a year or so before burning after after seeding. So the second question: in field or cutover, do you? Do you establish trees or understory first or both concurrently? That's a great question and it's a question that um, we're still trying to answer. Um, right now with the CRP program, the CP36, it's establishing longleaf and understory species at the same time and um, it may be it may work better to wait until after trees are thinned in order before you um, establish your understory species. We're really trying to figure that out still um, because as those trees grow in, they're going to start shading out those species. So we're we're trying. Um, there's still a lot of questions uh, with that. Okay. On established. Chris, your question about, I'm trying to follow the thread here, um, no, how about an established, okay, to his first question. Yes. Um, on established grasses, they should, um, I mean, you should be able to burn them, you know, as soon as they're established. They, um, they'll, they'll do fine. I would just be, um, I would wait before um, burning after you've seeded, just because um, those plants are so small and delicate. Have I dealt with fallow citrus grove with high copper rates? No, I have not. That's not something I have, have dealt with. And you know, there's a lot of folks down in Florida too that have have dealt with the mining operations as well, which I haven't had any experience with either. But those are um, definitely going to be some more challenging sites to work on. So JJ wants me to go back over the first couple of slides, I think. I think we I don't think we really missed anything. Um, this was just the beginning slide and then talking about plant diversity and number of species at um, smaller scales is um, comparable to rainforest or high diversity um, pop or Habitats. I think we covered most of this. Okay, we have another question. Would recommend annual or skipping years to burn your established grass plantations? Um, I would probably skip years just to allow for, for some flowering on, on a lot of the plants. Um, if you burn every year, you're not going to you're not going to allow for a lot of seedling recruitment because you're going to burn up your seedlings if you if you have had flowering with your plant. So I'd probably wait, um, do it every couple of years for burning. All right. Um, at this point, let me push out the uh, link to the quiz and the evaluation. I've posted it also in the uh, chat window, and you would have gotten an announcement about that. You can click on that link or you can uh, wait here a second and I'll be pushing it out. And what's going to happen is the browser is going to open up in your uh, um, on your computer if it's not already open. It may open up behind Collaborate or it may pop up in front. So, And be patient. It's uh, trying to load all 60 people at the same time. So. Okay, while we're waiting, uh, hear from Kendall's S. Clardy. Yeah, just to answer to Kendall's question above. And Kendall asked, 
she asked, do you establish understory first or both concurrently? And right. my answer to Kendall was that we're really trying to figure that out still. You could do it either way. Um, some folks say that maybe it's better to wait until you thin a, a plantation stand to allow more light to be able to get through. But then again, with with long leaf, I mean, pr fairly open canopy, so you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of light coming through anyway. So um, it's kind of in such early stages of of many of these understory plantings to see kind of how they do in the long run in terms of if you do it concurrently. So it's this, those are one of those research questions that really needs to be addressed. And um, and like I said, you could do it either way. Okay. And with that, um, do we have, I think we got time for one more question before we uh, call it to the end of today's webinar. So if anybody's got one last burning question. In case somebody's typing that in, let me just take the time to uh, thank you, Carol, for uh, all the time and energy it takes to put together one of these webinars. I do appreciate everything you've done, and it's been a great topic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, there's one more question. Thanks. How does soil compaction from coal mine reclamation projects affect these understory plants? Um, that's a big challenge, and folks down in Florida have been doing a lot of um, not coal mining, but um, other mining reclamation projects where you really have to kind of reconstruct that soil layer in order to um, in order to restore those sites. So that's a, a much bigger can of worms than say just restoring an, an old field. So, um, and I personally have not worked in those habitats. And here's something from JJ, also to thank the Dobbs Foundation for providing assistance in putting these webinars together. Yes, we do appreciate that assistance. Thank you. And with that, uh, we'll call it the end of today's webinar. I'd like to thank everybody and remind you that the webinar is being recorded, so we'll be archiving that, and you'll be able to find the archive version on forestrywebinars.net. Just look under previous webinars, and you'll see a it lists it with the rest. Thank you. Thank you.